Hi, uh, Steve Reynolds had the idea that we should try filming one of my, our, my, my walks. Um, and so I am here at Whitestone Pond, named after the white stone which stands over there. It's a very ancient milestone, almost illegible, but I'm told it says four miles from St Giles's and four and a half miles and 29 yards from Holborn Bars. Uh, now, if you follow me, I'll move over and I'll show you where the second observatory in London is placed. This observatory was built in 1909, owned by the Hampstead Scientific Society and is generally open to the public. It's due to open again in uh, September of this year. It's built on top of what is the first reservoir to be built in, uh, for Hampstead and was constructed in 1856. Well, here we are at Whitestone Pond. It was really originally a dew pond. A dew pond was um, a, an area created with a watertight clay base and collected rainwater and dew uh, from the early mornings and was used for cattle and sheep. But as the transport uh, in London developed and there were more and more horse and cart traffic coming up from London, it was redeveloped to accommodate and help water the horses. And there are two ramps which have been built to allow the horses and the carts down into the water. So its next reincarnation really was when Hampstead Heath became a place of uh, leisure for Londoners and it became known as Hampstead on Sea. And there are pictures which shows the type of things people did on their Sundays, which was boats floating, uh, floating their model boats and uh, paddling. And it was, became a very popular area. We're also near to this flagstaff, where once stood one of the Armada beacons but it's the highest point in London at 440 feet. And it's on what's called the Northern Heights. Uh, the Northern Heights stretch from uh, Swiss Cottage, Finchley Road, all the way over to Coney Hatch Lane. And I will speak more about them later, but it was originally a, a, the bank of a huge river that flowed through central London. Uh, back in pre-Ice Age. Here we are at Jack Straws, uh, named after what some people think was the, uh, one of the leaders of the Peasants' Revolt with the name of Jack Straw. He was uh, one of the leaders along with um, John Ball, uh, the, certainly the peasants uh, and the people rebelling did stop here on, on the heath on their way to London, but it is now believed that that's a bit of a, uh, a myth and that it's more likely the pub got its name from um, the farming uh, community who often went by the name of Jack Straw, uh, similar to uh, those who were in the Navy who were Jack Tars. But there has been a pub here on this site since uh, the 16th century, but the one you're currently looking at has, was rebuilt after the Second World War. This area has a, a little history of its own. Um, for, from the Middle Ages up until the early part of the 18th century, it was basically an area where the very poor and uh, destitute lived in makeshift houses and camps. But 
as the area got more popular with the uh, better and well-off well people in London, the, they were cleared away and some splendid mansion houses were built here. And one of the people who lived in uh, these mansions was a man called uh, William Granfield. Uh, Granville, um, probably forgotten now, but considered one of the best prime ministers we've ever had. He served until about 1809 and was one of the major mover, mover, movers of the anti-slavery bill. So a good man. Um, unfortunately, this along with the magnificent house that was in Golders Hill Park were both hit by parachute bombs in the Second World War. And these bombs uh, exploded about two meters from the ground level and flattened everything that stood in its path. So the mansions were completely demolished and the only thing really remaining now are the trees which belong to the garden. And there's one or two quite rare trees here, I'm told, one being a cucumber tree and another one a handkerchief tree. But it was, the houses were never rebuilt and the land has now been reclaimed by the heath. Unfortunately, because of the lockdown, we can't get in to this uh, rather splendid structure behind us, um, which is a pergola. It was formed and is part of the garden of ho and house, which was largely developed by Lord Leverhulme, the soap magnet, who was a great benefactor and philanthropist. Um, there was a Georgian house on the site called Hill House, and also uh, a, a place called Heath Lodge. Uh, the architect was a man called uh, Thomas Mawson and both of Mawson Leatherhoom were lucky that when they were designing uh, the house and came to construct it, the 70 mile stretch of the northern line from Hampstead to Golden's, Golders Green was under construction and a lot of the earth that was uh, removed from the tunnels came here to this site and leveled up the ground so they could create um, a bigger and more magnificent garden and were then able to build the pergola. Um, we'll move on uh, down to another part of the pergola now. The pergola is 860 feet in length, uh, about 270, 280 meters. Uh, the first part of it was constructed in the early 1900s, uh, but uh, the uh, second part was built um, uh, later on, uh, which is the part we're now looking at. Um, it leads on to uh, an area called Hill House Park, which again we can't get into, uh, but on that site, Heath, uh, a Georgian building called Heath Lodge stood, but um, Leather Hume and his architects demolished this and developed a beautiful Italianate garden. Um, from the end of the pergola, you can see views all the way to Harrow on the Hill. We are now on an area of the heath known as West Heath. Um, this, if you'd come here in 1870, this would have been virtually unwooded. Uh, it was used for grazing sheep. Uh, but once this activity stopped, the area has returned to woodland uh, and there are virtually no uh, open spaces.
we are walking down to Golders Hill Park and this all forms this wonderful green area which if we include Golders Hill Park uh, is about 1,000 acres in all. Uh, it's um, saved by various people for the general public in the late Victorian and early Edwardian times. Leg of Mutton Pond, named because someone once put a leg of mutton in the water uh, to keep it cool and it appeared to have worked and it was then called Leg of Mutton. We have now entered Golders Hill Park. Um, it's a beautiful park. It was originally privately owned but was handed over together with the house to the uh, LCC in 1898. Um, anyway, it was one of the government bodies, but I believe it was the LCC that um, took it on originally. It is now managed by the City of London Authority. If you ever get the opportunity to visit this park, uh, there's a lot to see here besides the magnificent trees, uh, there are water features, um, wildlife, uh, there's a small zoo, uh, tennis courts and uh, many other uh, features. So if you ever get the opportunity, I suggest you take the opportunity and come here and uh, spend a nice Saturday or Sunday uh, having a wander and relaxing in the tea rooms when they open again. I'm standing under what is supposed to be an artwork but I don't like it. I don't know what it's supposed to represent but anyway someone's put it here so <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Behind me once stood a magnificent house which was built by the uh, owner of this park and as I said earlier he bequeathed the park and the house to the public in 1898. Unfortunately again the house was hit by one of these parachute bombs and was completely demolished and so the only thing that is left are the, uh, the statue uh, to the right of me. We are now in part of the village of North End, the other part being across the road and runs alongside the Bull and Bush pub. Uh, the village was originally known as Sandgate and was mentioned in the Doomsday Book. Uh, it was known as Sandgate because of the huge quantities of sand that abounded in the area. Here we are at the old Bull and Bush. There's been a building on this site since 1725. Uh, it was originally a farmhouse, but in 1721, the then owner managed to get a license to sell owl. And so it, it's been a pub since that date. It, uh, William Hogarth used to come here and it's reputed that he helped design uh, the gardens which were here at the back which are now sadly disappeared. The house was, or the pub, was uh, extensively reconstructed in uh, 1924 and there's been many uh, renovations and, uh, to the pub since then. There was even a musical song uh, written for the pub and it was come 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 and make eyes at me down at the old bull and bush da ra 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 come come drink some pork wine with me down at the old bull and bush there's a little german band ra da la 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 da da down at the old bull and bush come 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 and make eyes at me down at the old bull and bush. Bum, bum.
We are now in the other half of North End Village and immediately behind me uh, you can see the left hand corner of a house which is painted white. It's between the trees with four chimney pots. Um, it is a house where Elizabeth Fry, the Quaker and prison reformer lived. Uh, Elizabeth Fry was a member of the Gurney family who were also Quakers and were bankers. She married uh, a man called Fry who was also a banker and his family later um, uh, developed the Fry's Chocolate uh, Company. Elizabeth Fry was very active in bringing reforms to the prisons which were where people lived in the most deplorable conditions and she spent time in, the, in one or two prisons to experience what people suffered and she was able to relate these to the politicians at the time and reforms eventually happened. It's also a house where Buxton, um, the first baronet Buxton, also spent time. He was a Quaker but also a member of the Church of England and was very much involved in the anti-slavery movement. As were many people in this area, like William Glanville, who I mentioned earlier, and Stan Samuel Hoare. They were all, um, those and others like Wilberforce, all used to meet in this area to uh, work their plans and policies out to um, get rid of slavery within the British Empire. This avenue uh, was, origin was the original road into North End Village, but for some reason that no one knows why, um, they built the road which is now opposite the Bull and Bush in 1730, and they dug it through the highest part of the hill. Um, so this road uh, became, uh, came back to nature almost. Uh, it's lined with the most beautiful lime trees and is a sight worth coming to see. It's a, a beautiful area. As we go up to the path, we'll see an opening in a wall. And this leads onto an area of land where a, a magnificent Georgian mansion once existed, uh, which was owned by Charles Dingley, who was the owner also of Golders Hill Park. He allowed William Pitt the Elder to live here for a couple of years um, uh, to en enable Pitt to recover from what was a nervous breakdown brought about by the continual wars with France. It's now been, uh, it was knocked down for some reason um, in 1952 and it's been reclaimed by the Heath. Michael Ventris, translator so-called genius, uh, the interpreter of the Menonian, Menonian language, uh, either, I, uh, otherwise known as Linear B. The, the hieroglyphics, words, had been uh, known of for a very long time, but no one could interpret them or translate them until Michael Ventris came along. And what he discovered was that when, when the Greeks entered into the uh, area now we know as Greece and Crete, um, they overcome came the Manones, but they uh, used and in, incorporated in their own language the Manone words. And so what they were able to find out is that Greece, Greek, is the oldest language in the world after Chinese. Unfortunately, Ventris died at a very young age, as you'll see from the plaque, at the age of 34. You may see a blue plaque here, uh, noting that Pevsner uh, lived here um, for quite a number of years. Um, Pevsner was a German immigre who uh, came here in the 1930s 
um, fell in love with the country and decided that uh, we, he should record um, as many of the churches and historic buildings as was possible. So he travelled the length and the breadth of England and probably Wales. I've never read the full, his full, book, full works, but it's still in publication now. This is the wilds, or the old wilds. The building behind us here um, it dates from the 18th century, early 18th century, and was originally a barn, but has now been made into a house. Um, there's been a farm on this site, has been recorded back as early as 1600s. Um, there's a blue plaque on the building telling you that William Blake lived here and that the house was owned by, by John Linnell, another artist and friend of Blake. Also another very famous person lived here called Raymond Unwin, who was an architect but started his life as a structural engineer in the mines. But he was in, had inspiration to build better quality housing and more beautiful type housing for the general public. And when he was at university, he met a man called Barrett, who later married Elizabeth, who became Elizabeth Barrett. And the, fortuitously, they all came together and managed to save what is now called the Heath Extension, which we'll get a brief glimpse of shortly. I'm standing in what is the remains of an old Saxon ditch. It predates the Normans and was no one's quite sure what it demarcated, but it was probably an area between a Saxon lord's land and the, um, the church or the king's land. Um, it's now, of course, been filling up. It was much deeper with detritus, uh, but it also was until the 1970s um, uh, local council reform act which edward heath brought in was the boundary line for between barnet and the old parish of hampstead i'm standing here on the edge of what is known as the heath extension this area of land was also, um, a larger area in this was acquired by Elizabeth Barrett and her husband um, with the idea of saving it for people to use as, for recreational purposes, but also to build houses. You can walk uh, the whole length of the extension, uh, which is about one mile, and you'll come to Hampstead Garden Suburbs, which is also the inspiration of the Barretts who wanted to build housing for the less well-off. Raymond Unwin was the architect, and Unwin had met Elizabeth Barrett's husband at university. Um, uh, Barrett was to become a priest, but Unwin talked him out of it because Barrett was more interested in uh, social and needs and the poor. Unwin um, designed Hampstead Garden suburbs, although many of the houses had um, uh, different architects involved in the design of uh, some of the property, including the church. Uh, but um, unfortunately, the First World War intervened and although some houses were let to uh, artisans or poorer people, um, they ended up being uh, inhabited by people of better means. We 
are now entering into an area called Sandy Heath. We've now nearly reached the top of the hill, but when we get there, you'll see that uh, the hill, uh, the top of the hill was virtually dug away uh, to uh, collect sand. And uh, I will tell you more about that when we get to the top. This area is an ancient area, uh, geologically. Um, it, it, can, it dates back to approximately 100 million years when there was a huge river uh, where the Thames now is, but actually filled the whole of the valley you can now see uh, from uh, the northern heights, and was a huge sandbank of this river. I mentioned earlier that it uh, stretched, the northern heights stretched from uh, Finchley Road, Swiss Cottage, to uh, Coney Hatch Lane in uh, Frying Barnet and was one, really one massive sandbank and it was called Bakeshot Sand. The ponds we've been looking at, they have the name of Iron Pan Ponds because this sand had a large amount of iron in, the, in it. And when they were digging the sand out, the, these were bigger, dug to deeper depths, and the iron in the sand uh, uh, melted and mended with the sand and became a solid base. And so the water it, it remains as, and is, uh, as a catchment for rainfall. Uh, the, area was uh, very heavily excavated in the 1860s. These trees behind me on the small mound uh, managed to survive the excavations and so they did predate 1860. But you will see uh, an old photograph which Steve will be reproducing that shows you the extent of the excavations here and the enormous damage done to the landscape. Originally, uh, the, the Spaniards Road, which is over here to the right, had an embankment which was about two metres above the road level. And that is now down to the road level and it's about 30 uh, feet or five meters or so below the road. So a huge amount of sand was removed from this area by the owner, Marion Wilson, which was then supplied mainly for the Midland, the building of the Midland Railway and particularly the St Pancras area. Sand had been taken from this area for a long time for road repairs and, and, um, and other building work. And the reason, as I mentioned earlier, the village, which is now called North End, was called Sandgate for a good reason. The other reason this I love this area is it gives us it gives me hope for the future because what we're looking at is how nature can recover in what is a relatively short time. Uh, most of these trees here have grown since the excavation stopped in the 1870s uh, so nature has a wonderful way of recovering. Standing here and to my right and, be and behind me is Sandy Heath, which we've just walked through. And to my left is the area known as South Heath. Both these areas were owned by Marion Wilson, 
and his family, who had owned the land since late Tudor times. This driveway was developed in the 1840s uh, by Marion Wilson as he planned to build a housing estate here, very similar to what we now see in Bishop's Avenue. In other words, houses for the world to do. Uh, he started this, he also built the aqueduct, which many of you might know, and there's several other artifacts which he built and have left his mark on the heath. But he was thwarted by Parliament, who would not allow him to go ahead with the development. He tried several times again, but was always frustrated uh, by Parliament, who become increasingly aware of the need to have open spaces for the population of London. But they say in a peak of spite, he decided to dig up Sandy Heath uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, did an awful lot of damage there. He also uh, planted trees which weren't native to the area. We see, we'll see pines, you'll see a lot of turkey oaks, what I call turkey oaks on the heath and uh, immediately behind me to my right are evergreen oaks. Lovely trees but they're not native to Marion Wilson. Behind me you can get wonderful, a wonderful view of the city and also the tops of the houses for an area called the Vale of Health. Um, it was originally thought and believed to be an area where people took refuge from the plague, but there's no evidence for this. However, in 1801, uh, a man who owned this land, and I'm going to have to look at my notes to remind me of his name, it was uh, Hatch, um, and the area was known as Hatch's Bottom. And as he wanted to build houses there, he couldn't very well, as a marketing ploy, uh, and this is what people will now believe, he couldn't call it Hatch's Bottom, so he called it the Vale of Health. Um, there is, he also, there was a swamp area there which he drained and uh, became a reservoir for, those, uh, for that uh, particular development and um, is there today and is now there for the birds and for people to get their dogs uh, uh, washed in. Uh, but uh, it's uh, a beautiful area, uh, well worth a visit, and I've taken some of you there, and it's the most amazing people have lived there and were born there. But we'll have another tour around the place perhaps another time. Well, we're back near to Whitestone Pond. And this lane behind me is known as Judge's Walk. It was originally called Prospect Walk, but in the 17th century, it got this name because the judges and uh, people from the legal profession came up here to live and get the fresh air uh, to avoid the plague that was regularly breaking out in London, especially in 1665. Behind me, are the remains of three avenues of trees. They consist of uh, lime and beech trees, but originally there would have been elm trees here, but sadly elm trees have de departed our landscape. But you can still see what remains of these avenues. Well, standing here at the top of Windmill Hill, uh, called because originally there were two windmills here, I think until the early part of the 19th century. Uh, behind me, and to my left, at the bottom of this hill, uh, John Constable lived. He used to come here uh, and visit at least once a year from uh, Suffolk uh, to uh, do his paintings. And there's many paintings that Constable did of the heath. Uh, which, and particularly from what is behind, in front of me, is a place called Branch Hill, which we'll now walk over to. 
in John Constable's time, standing here uh, and immediately in front of me, you could see all the way to Harrow. Uh, and if I turned my head a little, and uh, you would see all the way to Windsor. So you had marvellous views from the top of this hill of Old Middlesex and the county of Berkshire. The reason these views are now not uh, possible is that in the 20th century sheep grazing stopped and gradually the, the area of West Heath was reclaimed by woodland and forests. Well, we're back here at Whitestone Pond. I hope you've enjoyed the walk and I do hope that with lo when lockdown ends we'll be, you'll be able to join me for a walk around uh, other parts of the heath. There's an awful lot to see.